Chapter 7, The Evidence of Count and Countess Andretti. Count and Countess Andretti were, summoned, were next summoned. The Count, however, entered the dining car alone. There is no doubt that he was a fine-looking man, seen face to face. He was at least six feet in height, with broad shoulders and slender hips. He was dressed in a very well-cut English tweeds, and might have taken for an English man, had it not been for the length of his moustache, and something in the line of his cheekbone. Well, monsieur, he said, what can I do for you? You understand, monsieur, said Pyro, that in view of what had occurred, I am obliged to put certain questions to all the passengers. Perfectly, perfectly, said the Count, easily. I quite understand your position, but I fear that my wife and I can do much to assist. We were asleep and heard nothing at all. Are you aware of the identity of the deceased, monsieur? I understood it was the big American, a man with a decidedly unpleasant face. He sat at the table at meal times. He indicated with a nod of the head at the table where Ratchet and McQueen had sat. Yes, yes, monsieur, you are perfectly correct. And that dude on the name of the man? No, the count looked thoroughly puzzled by Paros' queries. If you want to know his name, he said, surely it is on his passport. The name of his passport is Ratchet, said Pyro, but that monsieur is not his real name. He is a man, Cassetti, who was responsible for a celebrity kidnapping outrage in America. You have been there, perhaps, monsieur le comte. I was in Washington for a year. You knew, perhaps, the Armstrong family? Armstrong? Armstrong, it is difficult to recall. What meant so many? He smiled, shrugged his shoulders. But to come back to the matter in hand, gentlemen, he said, what more can I assist to you? You were tired of rest, when, Monsieur Le Comte? Hercule's uh, prior's eyes stole to his plan. Count and Countess Andrani co a co a co occupied compartment number 12 and 13 adjoining. We had one compartment made up for the night while we were in the dining room, dining car. On returning, we sat in the other for a while. Which number would that be? Number 13. We played piquet together. At about 11 o'clock, my wife retired for the night. The conductor made up my compartment and I also went to bed. I slept Saturday until morning. Did you notice the stopping of the train? I was not aware of it until morning. And your wife? The Count smiled. My wife always takes a sleep sleeping draught when traveling by train. She took her usual dose of trionol. He paused. I'm sorry, I am not able to assist you in any way. Paro passed him a sheet of paper and pen. Thank you, Monsieur Le Comte. It is a formality, but will you just let me have your name and address? The Count wrote slowly and carefully. It is just as well that I should write this for you, he said pleasantly. The spelling of my country estate is a little difficult for those unacquainted with the language. He passed the paper across to Pyro and Rose. It will be quite unnecessary for my wife to come here, he said. She can tell you nothing more than I have. A little gleam came into Pyro's eyes. Doubtless, doubtless, he said. But all the same, I think I should like to just have one little word with Madame, Madame la Comtesse. I assure you, it is quite unnecessary, the Count's voice rang out authoritatively. Paro blinked gently at him. It will be a mere formality, he said, but you understand, it is necessary for my report, as you please. The Count gave way grudgingly. He made a short form bow and left the dining car. Paro reached out a hand of passport. It set out the Count's names and titles. He passed on to the form the further information, accompanied by wife, Christian name, Elena Maria, maiden name, Goldenberg, age 20. A spot of grease had been dropped on it at some time by a careless official. A diplomatic passport, said Embok. We must be careful, my friend, to give no offense. These people can have nothing to do with the murder. Be easy, Monvo. I will be most tactful, a mere formality. His voice dropped as the Countess Andrini entered the dining car. She looked timid and extremely charming. You wish to see me, Monsieurs? Of mere formality, Madame la Comtesse. Paro rose gallantly, bowed her into the seat opposite him. It is only to ask if you saw or heard anything last night that may throw light upon this matter. Nothing at all, Monsieur. I was asleep. You did not hear, for instance, a commotion, a commotion going on in the compartment next to yours? The American lady who occupies it had a quite an attack of her hysterics and rang for the conductor. I heard nothing, Monsieur. You see, I have taken a sleeping drought. Ah, I comprehend. Well, I need not detain you further. Then as she rose swiftly, just one little minute. These particulars, your maiden name, age, and so on, they are correct? Quite correct, monsieur. Perhaps you will sign this memorandum to that effect then. She signed quickly, in a graceful, slanting handwriting. Elena Andrini. Did you accompany your husband to America, madame? No, monsieur. She smiled, flushed a, light, a little. We were not married then. We have been married only a year. 
Ah, yes, thank you, madame. By the way, does your husband smoke? She stared at him as she stood poised for departure. Yes. A pipe? No. Cigarettes and cigars. Ah, thank you. She lingered, her eyes watching him curiously. Lovely eyes they were, dark and almost shaped with long, with very long black eyelashes that swept the exquisite pallor of her cheeks. Her lips, very scarlet in the foreign fashion, were parted just a little. She looks exotic and beautiful. Why do you ask me that? Madame Par waved a hand. Detectives have to ask all sorts of questions. For instance, perhaps you would tell me the color of your dressing gown. She stared at him, then she laughed. It is corn-colored chiffon. Is that really important? Very important, madame. She asked curiously, are you really a detective then? At your service, madame. I thought there were no detectives on the train when it passed through Yugoslavia, not until one got to Italy. I am not a Yugoslavian detective, madame. I am an international detective. You belong to the League of Nations? I belong to the world, madame, said Pryor dramatically. He went on. I work mainly in London. You speak English? He added in that language. I speak a little. Yes. Her accent was charming. Pryor bowed once more. We will not detain you further, madame. You see, it was not so very terrible. She smiled and clapped her head and de departed. Ella Jolifim, said M. Bach appreciatively. He sighed. Well, that did not advance as much. No, said Pryor. Two people will sell nothing and her nothing. Shall we now see the Italian? Pyro did not reply for a moment. He was studying a grease spot on a Hungarian diplomatic passport.